Number 10, Nazi Nazi. There's a reason we don't do things like we did in ye olde times. We didn't know, but now we do. So there's really no excuse for acting up. A very common practice for marriage back in ye olde times was to marry a girl at the age of 12. And in case you're wondering, no, the man was nowhere close to the same age. Yes, it's just as gross as you think. No, I'm not happy talking about it, but that's just the way things went. I can just imagine how happy those young ladies were when their parents came to them and said, listen, the Lord across town fancies you and the dude's got the bag. So you're gonna marry him so mommy and daddy can get the bag too. That's just one example of the medieval business transaction. I mean, marriage. Marriage, marrying for love. <laughs> Number nine, pull up a chair. The people of my generation either struggle to phone the doctor to make an appointment because of crippling anxiety, or they flaunt it on OnlyFans. There's no in between. However, I still think most people would feel uncomfortable finalizing their marriage in front of a party of witnesses. I honestly cannot think of a more awkward situation. Do you cheer them on? Are, are there sports commentators talking about the moves? Are there snacks? You can be there for 30 seconds, or 10 minutes depending on who you're watching. It just seems like a lot of unpleasant viewing to walk out of a room later to then all agree that yes, yes indeed, that couple is married now. But hey, that's just how it went. Witnesses or family would watch you do what animals do on the Discovery Channel. Number eight, the birth factory. Soap and sanitation is one of the greatest things ever invented. Don't you just love taking a hot shower after a long day? Oh, I know I do. Hygiene was not the greatest back then, and while not the only factor, it did contribute to a high infant mortality rate. It was just one of the many factors. So when young women were married, and married rather quickly, it was time to start pumping babies out. It's more of a quantity over quality kind of thing. Before marriage was declared a holy sacrament, these things were happening everywhere. Pubs, town squares, heck, even in your house. Now, for the people at home, can you tell me how you feel about the holy sanctity of marriage? Especially if you've been married for more than 10 years. Does it feel good? I bet it does. Number seven, wrapped up. One of the weirdest superstitions and traditions that still carries on today is that the bride cannot be seen by the groom before she walks down the aisle at the wedding. Why? Well, it's bad luck. After all, that could ruin a marriage. Not like any other factors would have a hand in that. Like in-laws from hell are spending way too much money on the wedding, putting you in crippling debt right as you're just about to start your life together, right? Well, this was the way of the medieval wedding, and something used to even keep things mysterious was for the bride to wear a veil. It was thought that it would protect her from evil spirits, but also keep her from being seen by the groom, which honestly sounds like it might have been worse. So when the groom got to unwrap his wife, if he didn't like it, well, sucks to suck, brother. Just imagine your bride walking down the aisle, and then... Yes, I will get married to you. Let's do it. Number six, Mr. Steal Yo Girl. This one's pretty messed up. I'm not even sure how this was even possible, but hey, here we go. So on your wedding night, it was the legal right of feudal lords to come on down to your place and shack up with your soon-to-be wife. What? Who most likely was a virgin? That's right, the government would come down and fornicate with your wife. Sounds just like the IRS. Anyway, this messed up tradition is somewhat shrouded in curiosity due to its extremely uncomfortable nature and its legitimacy. It may or may not have happened, or at least if it did, it might not have been as commonplace as some people may think. Moving forward, I think it's safe to say that this tradition can stay in the past, as there's no need for the mayor of my town to be sweet talking to my wife during the wedding. Hey, hey Mr. Mayor, you get your hands off of her. Item number five, long skulls. One of the most bizarre beauty trends from ancient times, at least, was the process of head shaping. This unusual beauty trend caused people in modern times to think that aliens were real when remains were discovered with oddly shaped skulls. Some people believe that we had proven the existence of extraterrestrials, but in reality, it led to the discovery of an entire practice of human body modification for the purpose of beauty. The process of head shaping involves putting some kind of pressure on a baby's head so that it grows into a different shape. This was known to be done by using cloth or even boards to create the desired shape. This is one of the oldest beauty trends in history as the earliest evidence of modified skulls come from Australia and date back between 14,000 and 9,000 years ago. The skulls that were found had flattened foreheads and very prominent brow ridges. This practice also occurred quite often in South America where skulls with a variety of different shapes have also been found. I'm kind of glad that we don't do this anymore because I could not imagine going through life with a cone head. I wonder how it would feel to have a head shaped like that. My neck hurts just thinking about it. Item number four, 
five head. Let's go back to the Renaissance for a bit to talk about yet another one of their super strange beauty trends. They really had a lot of weird desires when it came to appearances, and I'm certainly glad that this next one is no longer in style, and I really hope it never makes a comeback. Back in the Renaissance, it was believed that girls with high curved foreheads were the most beautiful, but obviously not everyone can be built like that. As people do, they came up with a way of achieving this look without having to be born with said attributes. In order to have that big forehead that people so desired, women were known to have shaved or plucked the hairs from their natural hairline to make their foreheads look bigger and therefore more desirable. They really said, receding hairline, but make it fashion. Suppose. At number three, feet painting. Now you would think that all of the super bizarre beauty trends of the past were from way back in the day, but you would be mistaken. We saw some strange practices in the 20th century as well, especially during war times. Back in World War II, a shortage of silk and nylon in America created a bizarre beauty trend. Because these materials were needed to make things like parachutes and uniforms for troops, tights were quickly disappearing from stores. Because this was such a huge staple in women's fashion, they got creative and created a beauty trend where women would draw pantyhose arrows in their legs, dye them with different colors, and try and mimic the look of mesh tights to create an illusion close to wearing stockings. I feel like if this happened in today's time, I don't think I would be that desperate to do that, and you couldn't catch me drawing or dyeing my legs for this. I think I'll just stick to wearing pants. Item number two, strange corsets. Corsets have been around for a long time. They've come in and out of style, and even right now, corsets seem to be making their way back into mainstream fashion, though maybe not as extreme as back in the day. In the 19th century, having an hourglass figure was seen as the ideal body type, and so in order for many women to achieve this look, they wore corsets to cinch their waist. However, the looks were pretty extreme. Some women tightened their corsets so tight that their waist could be wrapped with two hands. Like, imagine that. Although this was seen as super chic back in the day, it was also causing some health issues because it would squish together people's organs, and as you can imagine, that's not a good thing. Eventually, corsets evolved so that rather than cinch the waist so much, it would just accentuate the hips to still give an hourglass shape without causing too much bodily harm. And finally, at number one, no-no piercings. How many of you guys out there have piercings? I have a few myself, I have my ears pierced, and obviously my nose is pierced, but there are so many other places that you can get pierced even in the no-no region. Back in the Victorian era, piercings down under were pretty popular and were considered to be very fashionable amongst wealthy women. Some women would have their nippies pierced and even chained together, and some men would even get their peepees some jewelry too. For women, it was all about trends, but for men back then, many of them got their nether regions pierced supposedly to make wearing tight pants more comfortable. This piercing was called the Prince Albert, and it was given that name based on the legend that Prince Albert got his little prince pierced in order to hide the size of his junk underneath his clothes. Whether or not that's actually true is beyond me, but I would imagine that getting that piercing would be painful. Absolutely painful. But remember, in the wise words of Beyonce, pretty hurts. Oh boy, was she right. Eating with the rich starts off the countdown at number 10. Medieval recipes depict a large variety of animals being served. Adding to the ones I listed previously are horses, lampreys, cranes, and crows. Hell, even beavers. And let's not forget the animals created by their chefs. One homemade animal was called a cockentrice, and it was actually multiple animals' bodies put together before being roasted. A helmeted cock was another chef creation. It was a roasted chicken wearing a tiny helmet that was sat on the back of a roasted pig. Because... Why not? Dinner in a show is always fun, so in late medieval Europe, it became fashionable to have an etrometta, which was an entertainment dish. One such example is bakers cooked a pie shell in advance, and then after it cooled, they placed live birds inside the pie and resealed it. When cut at the table, the birds would then all fly out of the pie, much to the amazement of the many banquet guests, assuming that all went accordingly. FIFA fans may want to skip out on this next one, because number nine in our countdown is making football illegal. That's right, while I may be referring to it as primarily soccer in this video, what was still called football at the time was made illegal in the medieval ages. Now there are quite a few reasons for this. Most popularly known is that the sport was extremely different then. It was violent and aggressive, resembling more of a mass brawl with minimal rules. However, it was also because only two years after soccer was banned in 1363, King Edward III would implement a mandatory archery education law. This would ensure his villagers could be used as 
soldier should need be. King Edward believed that soccer, but also sports in general such as handball, football, hockey, and cockfighting were distractions and at that time they could be doing better things. I'm sure there are many of you that would disagree. Next on the countdown is number 8, the future predicting friar. There's a lot to unpack here so I'll just jump right in. English Francican monk Roger Bacon is known through history for his shockingly accurate predictions of the future transportation and life that we have now. Bacon lived from 1214 until 1292 and was the successful creator of the magnifying glass, but he also famously predicted future machinery in his book Espetola de Secretis Opribus, if I got that right. Cars can be made so that without animals, people will move unbelievably rapid, and flying machines can be constructed so that a man sits in the midst of a machine, revolving some engines by which artificial wings are made to beat in the air like a flying bird. It's a little nonsensical, but you can see what he's implying. His other predictions included steamships, submarines, diving suits, and telescopes. That's pretty spot on for a guy who lived thousands of years ago. This is the same man who was also said to have sculpted a prophetic head of brass. Apparently having been warned by a spirit that he must listen to whenever the head first spoke, Bacon set his assistant Miles to watch over the sculpture, which he did even past Bacon's demise. It's said that after the friar's death, however, that was the first time it spoke. First saying, time is, then time passed. Ignored both times by a confused mile, the head spoke only once more to say time is past before it exploded into flames. And so the chance to consult the mysterious head was lost when it combust. What do you think of the legendary Bacon and his stories of mysticism? Time is past, as the sculpted head said, so let's be happy we left this weird tradition in the past. In at number 7 in the countdown, it's the medieval animal trials. Under the ruler's power, there was no exception to medieval law. And so it should come as no surprise that even animals could face the brunt of their alleged crimes. This was no casual affair. The rich and the poor gathered for these trials as spectators. Some of the accused animals were even dressed in wigs and gloves, fancy garments to be seen in front of the royal court as their fate was debated by the lawmakers. That should come as no surprise either, seeing as the medieval era wasn't exactly overflowing with entertainment outlets. There are records of at least 85 animal trials that had taken place during medieval slash middle age and while the most serious offenders were pigs by a landslide, there are records of some roosters and even one donkey facing the judge. What were these animals being charged for, you may be asking? Many times it was the act of attacking or eating humans, as food and grain for animals was so sparse they'd often go hungry. There were also some accused of being heathens or thieves or behaving in lustuous ways. So make sure you have a walking buddy and always look over your shoulder because I guess you never know when an ill-attentioned cow may be creeping up on you. Number 6 in the countdown is the Saints Galaska Day Riot. February 10th of 1355, a group of students who attended Oxford University decide to go into town for a pint at the Swindlestock Tavern. Little did they or anyone else know that this would be the start of a notoriously famous riot. It started with belligerent complaints to the tavern owner about the quality of their drinks and service. As the tavern owner was progressively more berated, he and other patrons lost their temper with these students. The escalation led to a verbal sparring between the students and bar patrons. Both sides ended up arming themselves, but luckily things were quickly interrupted when the mayor stepped in and demanded the arrest of the students who had harassed and assaulted the tavern owner, thus sparking this whole disaster. What should have been a peaceful resolution caused a chain reaction, however. Oxford students rose up in protest of their peers' arrest and swarmed to attack the mayor. News of that quickly spread and the townsfolk revolted immediately. Many Many of them were already very tired of these students and their entitled complex and had been waiting for the opportunity to rage against them. The riot that occurred ended the lives of 63 students and 30 locals. While the case's investigation led to Oxford winning against the town in court, the Oxford Council was still made to parade shamefully through the village every year on February 10th, and they did have to pay a fine to the families of each student lost. Number 5, Mamma Mia! The best man at your wedding was most likely the groom's best friend who he most likely met in college and probably was part of his fraternity. And when given the mic to make a speech that was slightly inappropriate for younger audiences, the most common words of his vocabulary were probably bro and dude. 
All college friends put aside, the best man of the past had more of a greater responsibility than regaling the tale of the kegger at Stacy's house. Besides the feudal government coming to tickle your wife's fancy, there were others who wished to take the bride away, Bowser style. The best man's job was to prevent any of this from happening. Trying to get away with Koopa kidnapping meant the best man was going to do battle with you. Or just make sure the bride is protected. Like, you know, trying to run away from an arranged marriage because women are treated like property. Basically, he's a Luigi to Mario, except everyone actually respects Luigi in this case. Number 4. Arranged Marriages All this stuff sounds awful, and you might be thinking, why do these women go along with this? Well, it's because they didn't have a choice. A lot of women simply didn't have the right to choose who they married. Kind of a rough time for the ladies. I would also hardly call these marriages marriages as it really was more the lines of something like a business deal or a proposal. Families promised daughters to others. Being basically sold off to someone probably isn't a good feeling. For wealthier families like royals, a lot of times it was just about wealth and power, but also about keeping alliances, keeping borders in check. Your daughter marries my prince, now we're allies. Oh, you've got a son? Great, because I've got a niece that just turned 13. Gross. Number 3. Marital Disputes I like to joke around in this channel. Ah, oh, hell, who am I kidding? I have to joke around all the time. But this is kind of a touchy subject. But it's the truth. Considering everything else that was going on, and it's not that far from the truth to say, that women probably were not respected well inside the home either. This was a time long before equal rights and the resources that women today still need in case of domestic issues. I, as an internet comedian, cannot do the subject justice as it's something of a more sincere conversation to be had. However, I can talk about it from the medieval times. And some men just needed to be put in the naughty corner. Bad. Life was a lot harder for the average Joe back then, which means it was a lot tougher for the average Jane. Tough conditions don't excuse men treating women that way, but what I'm saying is, it just wasn't a great time overall, especially for the women. Naughty, stay in the naughty corner, you bad medieval men, bad. Number two, mail order. This kind of goes without saying, but men basically just got to pick a wife. Using money, power, or because somebody just owes you a favor. You get to pick out a wife. It was basically like shopping for a new car. You look around, check your options. Remember, this is the time when women were treated as property. Perhaps the biggest divide between men and women back then is that while men treat marriages like business or political agreements, they are still looking for love, where for a woman, she just doesn't have that option. Sometimes marriages go bad, but can you imagine what it would be like to be in a marriage you didn't even want to be in from the start? Man, that's rough. Number 1. Married Games This one is just too weird not to mention. Divorces were not that common back then, till death do you part, and depending on if the church would even allow it, but however, in the yieldy times, in the land of Germany, there was a really, really messed up process called trial by combat, which basically meant when husbands and wives needed to work something out or separating, they fought for it, Hunger Games style. The man was placed in a hole to level the playing field, and the woman had a sack of rocks that she would use. Not that any married couple today would ever want to hit each other over the head with anything, right? Come on, that's no, you guys won't. You guys love each other. And when this display of happy matrimony was finished and a winner was declared, the other had their light snuffed out. In a nutshell, the only way to divorce or remarry was if your spouse ceased to exist. So, here's some weapons to deal with it. Go ahead, here you go. Crazy. Number 10, property. It should be no surprise to anyone watching this today, but women's rights and the treatment of women was not everyone's priority in the medieval ages. Dudes were just mean, I'm sorry. Where did it all stem from? I'm not sure, I'm just a guy with blue eyes, and sometimes I say funny stuff. But what I do know is that women were treated more like men's property, which is, that's, that's, that sucks, that's gross, no one likes that. Which they are not, thank you very much. Sometimes women were traded, like currency for livestock animals, land, and just business dealings in general, because women didn't have a say in the matter, like I'll give you two goats for my daughter, here you go dude, which is just, that's not a fair deal, dude. That's that's not a trade, man. Not a trade. Number nine, promising young woman. Remember when I said if I talk about medieval times, I was gonna bring this up? It's a classic, a medieval staple. Couldn't couldn't talk about medieval times without it, really. What am I getting at? Well, that's marrying a woman in her midlife, about about 12 years old. Yeah, I know. It's gross. Deplorable, despicable, naughty, and just unsavory. Okay, so people only lived to their mid-30s and 40s back then, so time is of the essence. Sure, I get it, but come on, man. I am hereby banning any cradle robbing or diaper sniping. That includes the dudes who out of high school and they're dating a woman still in high school. I'm banning it. That's it. Chetty says no. 
Number eight, bedroom watch party. Okay, let me paint the scene for you. It's 2009, you just finished pre-drinking and watching the latest episode of Jersey Shore with your friends. There's enough hair product in your hair to keep a bowl of lime jello still. You slap on some Uggs and head to the club. You meet someone who's cute AF. Maybe it's the tequila, maybe it's the apple bottom jeans, but you wanna come home with this person. Instead of making it to your bedroom, a bathroom nightclub is now your domain for love. People walk by and witness your actions. But you do not care because this is your life and it's 2009 and you can do whatever you want. Okay, so that, but medieval times. Yeah, it's not a nightclub, but people would just come into your bedroom to witness that you went through with it on the marriage. Nobody wants that. That's just weird. That's not normal. Come on in. Me and my wife are about to. Come on in. Number seven. The Hunger Games. In the not so common case of a woman trying to divorce her husband because, you know, she's most likely not being treated very well and she's just not allowed to divorce and it's really just a messy time for women. How do you lose a woman? You forget to cherish her. Or you fight in combat to determine who wins the divorce. And by winning the divorce, I mean whoever wins lives. Yes, this was something that was actually done in medieval Germany. Basically, there's a little arena. Husband gets put into a hole to make it fair, I guess. There's a sack of rocks and a club, and then you just full send it and start swinging at each other. I feel like most divorces suck. Not that I would know, I've never been married, but I mean, come on, are the married people really telling me at home right now that they wanna swing rocks and clubs at each other? <laughs> I don't think so. Number six, gross. Kangas Khan, maybe the most down bad dude to ever get on a horse and do what he did. Well, maybe except Arthur Morgan, but he's not real, even though I wish that chiseled, handsome, rugged man was. <sighs> Despite my daydreaming fantasies, I'm here to talk about a really bad dude, Kangas Khan, medieval conqueror and womanizer. He had so many wives, who a good portion of which were forced at sword point to be his wife, and husband and wives were not exactly sitting around the couch uh, watching news together back then. They, they did the deed, whether or not both partners signed off on it. What I'm getting at is he had so many offspring that his DNA is still with us today. 0.5% of the male population on Earth are descendants of the Mongol warrior. That's over 60 million dudes. That's just insane, bro. Number five, business casual. Let's get one thing out of the way. Jesters did not dress like this all of the time. That would be amazing, but let's get real. That would be quite itchy. I don't know, all those tights, can't wash your stuff back in the day. I don't know, I didn't want to get into it. Handling the hounds while wearing jingle bells also, you'd be a walking, talking chew toy. Bad idea. They dressed like normal people, of course. Well, rather they dressed like their masters did. They were hired as businessmen who spoke with purpose, and then when the time came, they would lean into whatever skill they brought to the table, be it juggling, singing, playing music, whatever. Now, the attire of a jester is what we recognize the most. Their fit was pretty unreal. Their outfit was bright, usually to get attention, but jesters also wanted to dress as comedically as they could. They wore colors that didn't match well together. They wore odd layers overlapping each other, just flaps of jesterness coming off. It grabbed your eye mid-stew. Their headgear was also quite fun. The ears were supposed to be the ears of a donkey. The ears of an ass, rather. With bells, of course, because, you know, they're fun. Number four, all around the world. Contrary to popular belief, the origins of a court jester did not begin with medieval castles or anything in the English days. They were around long before then. In ancient Rome, there were four types of jesters. There were Sanio jesters, who were pretty much mimes. They would make crazy facial expressions, their physicality was on point, they didn't wear masks or say words. Stupidest clowns, great name, did wear masks. They were the full on clown package. All the ruffles, the hidden face, tall silly hats, big bellies, really creepy, terrifying. I don't like clowns. They would use their riddles to entertain. They would use their words while the other guys just used their bodies. The Scura jesters were picked solely on their appearance. See, ancient Romans weren't as inclusive or well-mannered when it came to people looking different or having disabilities, so sadly they were hired on their oddities, to say the least. The fourth kind was moriones, is where we got the word moron from. They were the closest thing to our English jester that we have now. They would roast everybody, have a silly walk, a funny talk, and during the festival of Saturnalia, the shortest day of the year, these morons would be the lord of misrule. They would rule the day and tell everyone what to do. It was often a pretty silly time. Imagine an improv teacher doubling down as a dean for the day. Now you get it. 
Number three, not a trickster. Tricksters, clown, and jesters are commonly mixed up, and honestly, it's that's totally fair. One has a nose that goes bonk, the other dances with jingle bells, and the other plays tricks. It's pretty much the same to us now in our modern days, but tricksters have an entirely different origin than jesters. Jesters came from ancient Roman times. Tricksters from Norse mythology. Hermes, for example, in history, he was considered a trickster of his time. He was a messenger of the gods who also just happened to invent lying. Not, uh, not a good combo. So not only do they go against the rules of their kingdom, but they also go against our laws of physics for the most part. And this has us intrigued still to this day. We're bringing Loki, the trickster, to life. He's fighting the Avengers. He's on Loki season two on Disney+. Plus. It's still going. But back in Norse mythology, Loki was a shapeshifter who supposedly gave birth to Odin's horse. Must have hurt. Over time, the role of a trickster changed, and a lot of these fairy tales, we have trickster characters like Ruffle Stillskin, who'll you know pop out of a bush and then make Shrek sign away the day he got married. They screw things up more or less. That's the trickster. Number two. Jane Fool, one of the few female jesters in history. Here we go. We know about jesters enough now where we can move on to specific people from history. Like Jane Fool, for example. She was included in a royal family portrait. That's a big deal. She's in the background peeking through a doorway. That's pretty creepy, funny, and also pretty epic. She was never trained to be a jester per se, but she was born with the right idea of how to entertain. She was born a comic. She would say what was on her mind. She loved reminding the court that all men were fools before God. She liked to level people, bring them down off their, you know, throne. She would say shit like that, you know, she was great. She was close to King Henry VIII's wives, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Parr, and rumor has it, she was besties with Queen Mary the First. The only person dressed as well as the queen back then was Jane Fool. And finally, number one, Stanchik. One of the saddest paintings of all time, that of the sad clown, Stanchik. The court jester was working under the command of Sigismund the Old in the early 1500s. Now he was one of the most famous jesters in Poland. He was employed by three different kings, quite a big deal. So he never lost steam over time, but something did happen. He was considered one of the wisest, and one tale from his time has stuck with many historians. He was often upset with the king, specifically when Sigismund brought in a giant bear from Lithuania and then released it into the wild to later hunt. Sounds like a fun game, I guess. Or, you know, play Guess Who, that works as well. But what happened was the bear ended up hunting the king and even took his queen off of her high horse. Literally, she fell off her horse, was attacked. It was kind of brutal, I don't want to talk about it. Stanchik straight up ran away after this point. He jingled into the night and then everybody talked about him. How could he? He just left. I could have never. <gasps> He ended up defending his actions by saying it's a greater folly to let out a bear that was already locked in a cage. What a roast. A little roast and run. This painting shows the sad jester sitting next to the news that the Splensk has fallen to the Russians. The life of a clown is nothing but sadness, apparently. What a good note to end on. Kicking off the list at number 10, farting around. In the earliest accounts of the fool, going back to the 11th century, these fools were hired to liven up the party. Most of you may have an image of a jester in your head, and right now they're jumping around on tables, telling jokes, doing, doing this shit. It's pretty accurate. It was one of the best jobs to have, this title of a minstrel or a fool. It was an honor to have, really. The fool's payment was anything but a joke. Roland Le Petoir was rewarded with 30 acres of land from King Henry II as long as he showed up to court every year on Christmas Day to fart. To fart, to literally he would whistle, jump around, and fart. Imagine eating beans on Christmas Day, having a nice time with your family, and then Roland jumps on the table and starts farting all in and around your beans. <laughs> so gross. And then he leapfrogs over your head and then goes and heckles your aunts and uncles. I'd be upset. Christmas Day? What are you doing, man? I'm trying to eat beans. Roland the Farter was his nickname. How great is that? He would also whistle tunes in your face. Air would just come out of this guy from every hole. That's impressive. Number nine expert jugglers. I can't watch circus performers do anything. It makes me way too anxious. Seeing somebody like losing balance 50 feet above a crowd, they're like, oh, oh, my toes curl, I can't look. While some think of jesters as nothing but these drunk class clowns who would walk silly and talk sillier, they did some crazy stuff. Juggling was introduced early in the fool's game, but like Romans getting bored of gladiators fighting, juggling just wasn't enough anymore. They had to raise the stakes. So jugglers began throwing swords, daggers, battle axes, 
Anything you don't want above your head, gestures would juggle it in front of you while you're eating beans. While some can't watch juggling, others surely can't take their eyes off of it. This was used as an advantage in battle, believe it or not. Jesters would juggle knives, swords, whatever they could, but while they were doing it, they would talk smack to the kingdom's enemies. They would insult their enemy, basically roast them so hard that they break formation and would try and fight the jester at once. You're gonna fight Leapfrog Larry, who's juggling six swords at the same time? Good luck. They would literally chirp them until they left formation, and then at that time, the jester's like, go, I got him. Number eight, key delivery. Being a professional comedian is hard work. You could say a thousand hilarious, well thought out bits, but one ill-timed tweet that goes a little too far can ruin your entire career, apparently. Well, back in the day, being a professional fool was no different. You needed to find the balance of humor and wit, and it was harder back then, if anything, than it is now. Most of these jesters were given role of advisor to the king and queen. That's what makes them so important in history. The phrase, don't shoot the messenger, yeah, this is kind of where it comes from. The jester would have to tell them bad news, but in a positive way. For example, back in 1340, King Philip IV, his fleet was destroyed in a naval battle. The British just absolutely wiped them out. It was an otherwise devastating loss, but the jester brought this news in a positive way. He gave it a positive spin, rather. He said to the king, they didn't even have the guts to jump in the water like our brave French. Where if that was some random dude, his knees would be shaking. He has to tell the king all this horrible stuff, and he's not used to that. Jesters are used to farting on the king's lap. They're the ones to advise for sure. They're definitely the most comfortable with speaking ill truths. Number seven, bad news. Most of the time, jesters knew their way with words. They were royalty. They were smart, despite what their names make you believe. But sometimes the message couldn't be said with a grin or a pun. Sometimes the king would send these court jesters into battle first to deliver that first message. So no matter what the message was, this jester had to go and deliver it in his jester way. That was the whole point. They would tell a clown to be like, hey, go and tell them that we're going to fight. And he'd be like, okay. Jesters were a treat, but they were also quite disposable, sadly. Sometimes the jester would kick off the entire battle, demanding the opposing side to retreat while roasting them at the same time. It was amazing. It makes sense though, what better way to start a battle? A jester runs across the battlefield. He's like, hey, the king said he doesn't want it anymore. He doesn't want the kingdom. You can have it. We're not even gonna fight. It's all good. It's all yours. Uh, apparently the queen has something called ligma. <laughs> Number six, don't quit your day job. The life of a fool was fun and games, but certainly not all the time. They didn't party all day every day, okay? They weren't the group LMFAO. They had to sleep, they had duties to do. They performed the odd time, but on their off days when they're not juggling knives in front of children, they would tend to household duties, much more daunting than roasting the king in front of his family. They would be assigned to keeper of the hounds. Their hands were quite full during this clown downtime. They would have to travel to markets constantly to purchase livestock for the royal family. They fed the family and then entertained them. A true class act. On top of that, when it came to battle, jesters were the ones to hype up the army the night before. They would play music, tell stories, anything to boost morale. When it came to being on the actual battlefield heading towards battles, jesters would also ride across the front of their army, talking smack about the enemy, you know, still trying to hype them up, even on the day. Number five, the moss. I ain't gonna come in here and tell you I know what it's like to be a woman or pretend I understand. There's been lots of great photos of humans that have been taken throughout history, but one that we miss for sure is when I was a kid and I learned what happens to women on those special couple days of every month. Not shock, just confusion. The look on my face, it was it was priceless. I wish I wish y'all could have seen it. We got things mostly figured out now though, but think about the past. Medieval times, not an understanding time for ladies. There were just no products to help in that scenario. So have you ever wondered what they did? I did, weird thing to think I guess, but oh well. Moss pads, yeah. Take some moss, you wrap it up in a cloth, bada bing, bada boom, now you're in business. Which actually is really smart when you think about it. I never would have thought of that, but that's, I'm a dude, so I, would, I wouldn't think about that. I just don't, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think about those big thinking thoughts and things sometimes. I'm just a big dumb guy. Number four, witch hunt. This is also a time where if a woman speaks out of line, or does something to upset the feng shui of things, there's a good chance she will get labeled a witch and burned at the stake. This was becoming an issue because, well, it was becoming a witch hunt, meaning anything that was slightly not cool or basically anything people feared or disliked could be labeled witchcraft, and thus likely an innocent woman would be burned at the stake. I mean, it sounds like they had it down to a science, really. Woman does something crazy, will bring out the charcoal briquette. No, no, see, that's that's not right. It's not like they could have done this amazing thing called investigate. You know, see if the woman was actually innocent or the claims that she was a witch because she wants to be paid a fair wage like a man. 
Hmm, that doesn't sound like witchcraft to me. Maybe don't be so hasty to bust out the pitch and torches. That's all. That's all I'm saying. Number three, you gotta do what you gotta do. I know what it's like to be down on your luck. Trust me, it sucks. It's not fun. But you budget. Save and work hard. You'll be back in the black before you know it. Women of medieval times got up and went to work. The kind of work a lot of women were forced to do because of circumstances. The oldest profession in the book, Selim Booty. It's been happening since day one and it won't be going anywhere soon. Now, I'm not here to condemn that kind of work. And funny enough, in medieval times, it was considered to be an actual profession. I just feel if you're gonna be in that line of work, it should be your choice. I'm a Las Vegas kind of guy. I love gambling, boozing, and the freedom to do what you want after strolling out of a casino after too much drinking and gambling. If you know what I mean. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to make the bread, and they just had to do what they had to do. And that's it. Number two, Hell Hath No Fury. Princess Olga of Kiev was a prime example of Hell Hath No Fury like a woman scorned. Long story short, her husband was torn apart by trees. Some gruesome stuff. It was actually, if you're looking, it's, it's, not, it's not nice. So like the Sith on its worst behavior, she plotted her revenge. When 20 men she deemed were all responsible for her husband's passing, were coming into town, she had a large ditch dug where they were buried alive. That is that is so heinous, I, I can't even. She then extended a welcome to more of the men responsible. When they arrived, she invited them to wash up in her bathhouse, where she had the doors locked and the place torched, like it was a witch hunt or something. Just had them cooked, just threw, just cooked them up, just, but I mean, they, they burn women, so why not? Why not cook some dudes? Uh, okay. Number one, honestly, who throws a shoe? If you've ever been to a wedding, then you've probably seen the bride throw a bouquet of flowers to waiting bridesmaids and other lucky ladies. Because the lady who catches the flowers is the next woman to be swept off her feet and to be married. Put a ring on it. Kind of ending on a wholesome note here, which is kind of nice, but it's still a, a little messed up. Hear me out. In medieval times, it wasn't flowers. It was shoes. At first, it doesn't seem so bad, right? Shoes. We'll throw some shoes around. Why not? Besides, you know, the, the shoe being thrown too hard. You wouldn't want to catch a loafer on the side of the head. That, that would hurt. I I think we forget how filthy our shoes can be. I mean, they walk through everything, dirt, mud, blood, and if you're in medieval times, having a good old-fashioned wedding in the village probably meant some manure. Eesh. Well, I'm all about tradition, but maybe we could throw the flowers instead. They just smell better, and you know, there's just there's less poop. Kick it off the list at number 10, black cats. Yeah, we'll start this dark list off a little slowly. You know, we'll ease our way into the witch trials. You see a black cat cross in front of you, what's the first thing you think? Bad luck, bad omens, bad stuff? Does that cat belong to anyone? Maybe I should take it home and take care of it. Well, in 1232, Pope Gregory the Ninth, he exposed a cult of witches in Northern Germany. Yeah, he wrote an expose called Vox in Rama. He went in deep. He knew some of the ritual words used at these cult meetings. He knew everything, which in my opinion, a little fishy, right? This guy knows a lot. Were you involved, my dude? What's going on? He exposed the happenings, including the involvement of one black cat. They would oddly kiss it and worship it. Now, at first, when reading about this, I was like, oh no, the cat, what's gonna happen? No, it's good. It was cat worship in this way, which is odd, but better historically. The Pope did afterwards send hunters out to eliminate any cat in sight, so it is pretty dark and scandalous. The level of cats in the mid 1200s was almost at an extinct level. Pretty horrible, right? If only we had all those cats later on in 1347 when, you know, rats carrying the Black Death arrived. We definitely could have used a few cats, but eh, witches. Number nine, Flat Earth. Okay, it's 2022. We can watch live footage right now from the International Space Station just whipping around us. We can fly to Australia in this day and age. We can have a window seat and watch the entire commute. But there's still a good amount of people today that believe that the Earth is flat. How shocking is that? How scandalous indeed. The same guys who believed women were witches were also like, Oh, of course the Earth isn't flat, that's crazy. How conflicting is that historically? We think any time before Columbus, especially back in the Dark Ages, we have this general idea that they didn't know anything, specifically the scale of the planet or even the universe for that matter. We're still launching telescopes into space to record the edges of the galaxy. There's so much we don't know today, yet there's still flat Earthers. Shocking enough, the Middle Ages didn't see many of those. In the 13th century, navigators were regarding the Earth as a sphere with four cardinal points as well, even going back 
further, looking at ancient Roman days in 77 AD, Pliny the Elder, the ancient philosopher, also agreed on the Earth's shape. It was common knowledge, dare I say, even in the Dark Ages. So if you know any flat earthers, send them this link. And then also send them a link of the ISS. I don't know. Number eight, red hair problems. All right, if you're a redhead out there, I'm sorry about this one. I had to, I had to talk about it. History can be ugly sometimes, and more often than not, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Historically, urine has been used for the greater good. Teeth whitening, Roman laundry days, urine makes leather soft, we get it. The Spanish Inquisition brought with them the idea that red hair was a sign of witchcraft. Yeah, the sign of the devil himself. The manuscripts published at that time about redheads too didn't help, they were horrible. The Proverbs of Alfred warns against having a redhead as a friend. And then another manuscript, Secretum Secretorum, warns against using redheads as advisors. Yeah, not even a work friend. Sorry, Big Chad. Ooh. 14th century manuscripts tell me that you're working for the devil, so now we can't talk to you, all because you have nice hair. Another manuscript from the 14th century believes that redheads are rarely faithful in both friendships and romantic relationships. Yeah, if you have a redhead partner, don't go through their phone, okay? Don't listen to the Spanish Inquisition, okay? Don't listen to the devil. They're not working for the devil, okay? They're, they're just fine, they're, they're, they're redheads. Freckles as well, if you had freckles in the Middle Ages, Good game. Number seven, Macbeth's curse. Every curse starts somewhere, okay? All you theater kids out there probably know about this one. I feel guilty talking about this, here we go. There's a few things you can't say to an actor before a show, and oddly enough, good luck is one of them. Yeah, you're supposed to say break a leg. All these theater traditions you can't break, okay? You're about to go on and do Shakespeare, and do like this huge monologue wearing funky shoes. You gotta be in the zone, okay? You gotta, you know, it's like game day. Even actors have their playoff beards, you know what I mean? It's like a ritual, you gotta stick to it. This legend goes back to 1606, the time of Macbeth's first performance. The actor playing Lady Macbeth died right before the show, sadly, so Shakespeare had to step in and play the part himself. Now apparently at this time, a coven of witches cursed the show. Yeah, since then there's been tales of real daggers being used in the show accidentally instead of prop daggers. The Astor Place riot in New York City back in 1849, that was caused by rival actors both playing Macbeth in their respective productions. There's also countless amount of stories recalling botched performances of the play, but what do we think? Is this the case of being in your own head and we just never dropped it, or is the Macbeth curse real? I don't know. COVID of witches cursing plays. That sounds pretty pretty medieval. I hope it's not real. That would suck. I just got cursed. Number six, witches curse. Ah, more curses. Let's do it. From the 1400s to the 1700s alone, there were around 50,000 individuals who were all found guilty of witchcraft and wizardry. And we all know what that meant. But how many of those were actual witches? Like really, was this a real thing? Were any of them actually found guilty? Was any of them the red woman from Game of Thrones? Like, you know. Was, did she do anything? We'll start with a woman named Mother Shipton. Mother Shipton, AKA Ursula Southiel. She was a clairvoyant from the 16th century, England's greatest, if that. Her mother as well was a widely known uh, witch which is a little dark. But Ursula, she was good at her job. She was often compared to Nostradamus. So she was using her passed on abilities for the greater good. Again, greater good, the middle age greater good. She predicted the execution of Mary Queen of Scots and she also predicted the internet. Yeah, in the 16th century, she predicted that thoughts around the world shall fly in the twinkling of an eye. It rhymes, so you know she was on a good streak. Mother Shipton actually passed away a peaceful death, believe it or not. She wasn't hunted down by a mob or anything like that. She was actually buried on unholy grounds in 1560 which is insanely bizarre for a witch at any time. And the fact that people compared her to Nostradamus and she wasn't, you know, shocking. Dare I say, we have a good one. A nice good one for a halfway point. Number five, assassination. Let's say for a second you ain't such a bad guy. Let's say you're a king that everyone likes. You listen to the people's woes of hunger and pain. You distribute the wealth and your fashion isn't too ridiculous for the time. And I'll get to that later because that's, that's definitely a point. You care, which for the time is rare. Well, that's too bad because a lot of men in history, whether they were loved, hated, or something in between, there's always someone lurking around the corner waiting to pour poison in your ear whilst you sleep. Yes, the art of assassination, or at least as I'm told it uh, from ninja movies and Assassin's Creed. Many have and will succumb to an assassin, whether it was for political, financial, or just crazy reasons. It happens, and for some reason, no one ever expects to hit him blades. Well, I know, I know it. And I would never let my guard down for a second to allow that to happen. All right, we're good. We're fine. Just check. Number four, boiling in oil. Okay, let's just say you got caught in a Shakespearean crime of attempting to poison your king. Something about poison in the ear or something. Oh, do not fear, good friends. 
because you better call Ched. That's right, your, your internet lawyer. Doctor, fireman too. Don't forget that, I'm a doctor and a fireman. I do it all, folks. Well, I'd come to defend you in trial, but this isn't exactly a time for fair trials and innocence until proven guilty. And the opposite. I mean, come on, you got off easy, kid. They're just gonna boil you in oil, it's easy. Roaring flames, big metal pot, and they're slowly gonna dip you in. Won't be that bad. You'll be screaming in pure agony for five, ten minutes tops. What's the worst that can happen? Well, it'll be the worst pain that you've ever felt in your entire life, but hey, at least you'll look like a Popeye's drumstick later, am I right? Anyway, kid, if you need my legal services again, just uh, give me a call, if you can. I have to go help this bald guy in an RV, something about a lab, I don't know. Good luck. Number three, men's fashion. I know it was a long time ago, but what the heck happened? Calves were in, like big, they like big calves for some reason, I don't know why. I got big calves, you know what I'm saying? And so were Wario shoes, because Wario. As much as I love Wario, since I basically am him, I mean, that doesn't mean I want to look like him, feel like him. Longer the shoes, the higher the social status. Weird, right? I know. This was also the era of tunics, and if there's anything I've learned from watching Hollywood movies, and I've learned a lot, it's that you don't trust a guy in a tunic. So, if everyone around you is wearing a tunic, who the heck can you trust? Sheesh, no wonder kings were so paranoid. Except for Link, he's cool. We, we, we can trust him, we like Link from Zelda, he's, pre he's pretty sick. As for poor men and serfs, you wore basically whatever you could make or afford, which isn't much. There's no long shoes in the potato fields. I'll stick to my plaid. Lots of plaid. I can't help it, I'm Canadian. Number two, the rack. Ever just wake up one morning and give a big old stretch because it's Saturday morning, you got to sleep in, the sun's shining, and your bones feel warm from a little bit of sun that's just creeping through from the window. You take a deep breath of fresh air and walk downstairs to your fridge to prepare a feast for breakfast, fit for a king. To think of a day like that starts with a stretch. Well, medieval men got to stretch too, thanks to the help of a device called the rack. Think of a ratchet strap, except instead of your dad yelling at you to make sure the trailer's strapped down, you're the strap that's being stretched. Yes, the rack was a means of torment. Basically, your ankles were tied down at one end, your wrists were tied down at the other, and a large sweaty man turns a gear, and then you get stretched out like a pair of jeans you haven't worn since high school. No, that's right, I know. No, you can keep trying them on, but they ain't gonna fit. That's okay, keep telling yourself that, that's fine. Mine don't fit either. Number one, bloodletting. This is just always so weird to me. I, I, I just don't do well with blood at all, actually. I, I got some stories about that, maybe for another day. But basically, there was this medical practice floating around back then. If you were sick, not well, or you just needed to refresh, a medical professional, and I use that term loosely, a medical professional would treat your veins the same way your dad treats a Ford Bronco getting an oil change. Ooh, gross. Did it help? Eh, not really. Am I getting lightheaded just thinking about it? Yes, yes I am, actually. And, I, and I'm being for real, I, I get lightheaded thinking about it. Not even kidding on that one. For real, getting woozy. Number 10, famine. This was not modern times and nowhere close to the industrial agriculture industries we have today. Most folks lived in small towns that were self-sufficient with their farms and animals. After paying up or giving up what they had to their lords, of course, the commoners were not left with much. Men were expected to work all day to provide for his lord, family, and himself. Trouble is, if something even slightly disrupts the farming process, and trust me, there's a lot of factors that would lead to that, uh, then some people are gonna go hungry. When people get hungry, they do crazy things. I was crazy once. They locked me in a room full of rubber. Rubber makes me crazy. I was crazy once. They locked me in a room full of rubber. Rubber makes me crazy. Number nine, war. What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Uh -huh -huh. You guys love that song, I know you do. Picture this. You're a serf working day and night to feed your family. When a town crier brings news to you that your village is gonna be under attack and the invaders have been seen coming over the hill, just over yonder, it's somewhere over there. It's, it's over there. The king is sending his best knights to defend the castle, but you know, like many other folks in many other towns, that to protect your family and your stuff, your pitchfork is gonna need a sharpening. And maybe a fire buff. I like fire buffs, they're cool. Yes, war, the worst invention of mankind, when you think about it. War means you need soldiers, and that means men. Except for a few exceptions like Joan of Arc. You can throw them in too. Sadly for the peasants, it's a matter of protecting what's theirs. There's no glory in fighting for someone else's glory if it means your farm gets burned down in an attack, and then you can't eat, and then no one's hungry, and ah, no good. Number eight, pestilence. In case you didn't know, 
you probably do, but sickness was an issue for the folks in medieval times, especially if you're a man who's working in the fields or the markets or the public, trying to bring home whatever form of currency is appropriate for the area. You can't do anything if you're sick in bed, or at least that's what I used to tell my mom when I wasn't totally faking a stomachache because I didn't want to go to school. I totally wasn't faking it. I was sick. But a big bug going around at the time in people's tummies was the bubonic plague. Yeah, classic. The big one. Some statistics suggest staggering numbers of people succumbing to the plague. Millions of people and the plague isn't a pretty one. Skin turning black from necrosis, boils, blisters, ugh, it's a bad look. You don't, you don't want it. Number seven, serfdom. While not exactly like YouTube's least favorite S word, it's kind of similar and it sucks. Basically, you're in the lowest of the low in terms of peasantry. You are forced to farm and tend the land that the Lord owns. There's nothing like breaking your back for a guy who doesn't know that you're breaking your back for him. I'm curious, guys. Let me know what's been your worst job and why. I'm, I'm gonna read some comments again in a later video. But yeah, being a serf sucked. Imagine after all that awfulness that you have to pay your boss rent too because you also live on the property that you work. Yeah, not so fun. Pretty messed up. I'm glad we don't do that anymore. Number six, Jester. Imagine trying to write funny and comical things day in and day out until your fingers cramp. And you have to perform your material in front of a bloodthirsty crowd who's just itching to say something the second you make a mistake. Or if you upset the king, it could cost you your head. What a crazy job, right? Huh, I know. However, one jester had it all figured out. The one thing that binds us all together is humans. The type of comedy no scholar or peasant alike can escape. Farting. Yes. Take Roland the Farter, for instance, whose job was to fart. Every Christmas he would show up to the king's place and just let her rip. Boy, do I wish that was my job. Because, honey, let me tell you something. I got some special stuff up on my arse. Number five, Agnes Sampson. And now back to the dark stuff. This one's not as great. Turning the clocks now to 30 years after Mother Shipton, the general public isn't always so easy when it comes to clairvoyance. So around 1590, when King James VI, when he was ruling Scotland, this was an important time because the lovely Anne of Denmark, Norway, his wife, she was very much opposed to black magic or all that voodoo. She wasn't on board at all. During one commute back to Scotland, for example, the couple barely made it through a fierce storm. So King James VI, he was now convinced, because of his wife, that the storms were an outcome of black magic. Yeah, a witch cursed their commute. All because of a storm, they thought this, imagine that. So they charged one Agnes Sampson. The king and the queen all believed that these witches attended a coven on Halloween night, and that's what happened with their commute. So she was held prisoner until she confessed. And then at that point, she finally met her horrible fate. Her nonsensical, horrible fate. Number four, Plague Bearer. Okay, if you think your job sucks, Hear me out. The hot summer of July 1665. Okay, what do we do with all these poor souls who have been hit by said plague during the Dark Ages? You can't just hide them all in the catacombs this time, right? You can't just hide them in a random place. We don't have that. So a plague bearer is the person that you need. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s. But when the plague hit, they had to change things up a bit. Now things were a little bit dangerous. If somebody had the plague, these guys would be responsible for transporting them far, far away and then burying them. Plague bearers, that's crazy. A church would then house these plague souls far away from society. How grim is that? All because you got sick. But I mean, that's probably a good thing, all things considered, you know? Because anything we learned in the past couple years, it's like, oh yeah, things uh, spread. Just a little bit, including misinformation. Ha <laughs> ha. Number three, medieval barbers. A barber from the Middle Ages. Yeah, that title alone gives me the chills. If I have a toothache, I'm telling no one. That appointment's gonna suck, okay? Cavity, toothache, maybe you accidentally bit a rock, chipped a tooth, whatever. They would only pull it. Worst case, best case, your teeth are getting pulled no matter what. Yeah, barbers were responsible for cutting hair, pulling teeth, and bloodletting. The classic three-in-one appointment. Get it all done in 40 minutes or less. There you go. Keep the change, good sir. And a thing of ale. There you go. Get drunk, pull my teeth. Middle Ages. Back in the 1500s, patients were walking in with an arrow sticking out of them, right? Instead of cutting the tip off and then pulling it the opposite way, the arrow remover would cut into the injury, open it more, which would suck, and then it would hold it open. And then the barber would come in and then pull it out in his own barber way. Whatever his qualifications were, it didn't really matter. He was a barber, he was also pulling arrows out of your back. So, <laughs> you would go in for a toothache and then you'd leave with an amputated foot. You never know, medieval barbers. Sucked all the time. Number two, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort, I can't believe this is a real thing that real people did. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual 
activities. How dare they? How dare thou? Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with all of this shit. There was the first standard ducking stool, so women would have to, you know, sit in this chair, strap themselves down while sitting outside their houses or, you know, whatever. They get carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. That was the main key here, where you'd, you know, come out and go, shame, shame for 46 minutes and then go back inside. That was your day back in medieval times. They had sex. Can you believe that? It's disgusting. Let's take the day off work and embarrass them and make signs. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was then dunked into a river over and over again to cool her immoderate heat. Yeah, we gotta cool these witches down. Great. I wonder where all these people, like, did they not realize where they came from? This is the dumbest at least that's what French writer Francois Maximilian Mission says. They should cool off all of those angry villagers instead. They should dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody over here is getting some and they're not. Number one, meowing nuns. If I'm not gonna talk about this one now, then I'm not sure when I'll get the chance to talk about it again. Back in the Middle Ages, a group of nuns were doing their, you know, COVID nun thing as so many people did apparently back in. And this was odd in the Middle Ages because these nuns would have meowing sessions. Yeah, they wouldn't curse individuals. They wouldn't curse any long sea voyages. No, they would just gather around and meow all at the same time. The French coven, large, might I add, many of nuns here, they would spend hours meowing, like, in sync. They'd be like, meow. It would annoy nearby civilians so much that eventually soldiers had to come in and just beg them to stop. They're like, please, stop meowing. I don't know why you're meowing, but please stop. For most of these cases, most likely not witchcraft. This one here with the meowing nuns, I don't know. I think that was actually... Something was afoot, that was actually a curse. Either that or it's the greatest prank in history. Either way, we have to finish on a nice happier note, dare I say. Number 10, the kitchen. Now that you've got your appetite, let's talk about the kitchen. Major kitchens of the castle usually had to deal with providing at least two meals for several hundred people every day. As you can imagine, this is where the work would be put in. By a large staff too, usually in the hundreds. So you're sweaty from working and surrounded by a bunch of other blokes. Sounds pretty awful. But you didn't take into account the amount of heat. The guidelines on how to make enough food for a two-day banquet include the chief cook having to at least have 1,000 cartloads of good dry firewood and a large barn full of coal to keep the fires going. It's spicy in the kitchen, let me tell you. Number nine, the main hall. The idea of a standing army wasn't exactly a thing during the medieval period. So what you would have is your knights or castle soldiers. And unless there was a barracks, the main hall would often convert to have a bunch of cots in it where these soldiers would sleep. It could also be where your guests might stay, and even your servants if you didn't have a room for either of them. And then it became your dining room. It was also your party room and your courtroom. It was honestly a pretty versatile room. So much room for activity. You could probably imagine the amount of tomfoolery that happened here though. A large group of sweaty men and women after a feast and they don't have to walk home because they are staying the night. Nice. Number eight, the pooper. The title says unholy, but this room's main purpose is to have a hole. A hole for people to sit their little keisters down on and drop the kids off. Sometimes down a nice long shaft through the castle that went straight to the cesspit or to the moat. If the moat was a room, I'd probably include it on this list because yikes. A toilet isn't something you'd actually find in most medieval castles. There are easier places to do your business outside. The garter robe is basically a tiny little closet sized room with a hole in it for this sole purpose. But they were also used for storage, like when you had visitors. You gotta put their coats and cloaks somewhere. Why not next to where Steve is trying to go potty? Number seven, dovecoats. You know when you walk down the street and a white colored excrement falls on you from above and you look up? to see a pigeon just looking down on you as if it owns your whole existence? Imagine that, times like two and a half thousand in a circular tower and you've got a dove coat. These structures actually showed off status and wealth as only the lords were legally allowed to have them. Doves and pigeons proved to be an excellent source of food with their meat and eggs. Their feathers were also valuable and yes, even their droppings found use back in the day. Doves even had religious value, being associated with the Holy Spirit. Pigeons, on the other hand, are a menace to society and need to be stopped at all costs. Thank you for listening to my PSA. Gotcha, you little rascal. You were gonna keep watching this video without slapping that like and subscribe button, weren't you? That's fine. I guess you can do that. But gee, we would really all appreciate it if you just gave those buttons a little poke. And then we can poke back with more of these videos. Deal?
All right, moving on. Number six, the buttery. I can't believe it's not butter. Well, believe it, sister. This has nothing to do with butter. No, in fact, the name actually comes from beer butts, otherwise known as barrels. The room itself was located pretty close to the main hall, where yeomen would serve beer to the people who were too low in the ladder to be allowed to have wine. And it was usually connected to the beer cellar down below. How is this unholy? Because, I mean, I don't know about you, but I've never done a single holy thing after a few beers. At number five, kidney stones. Now I can't say that I'm all that familiar with the way that kidney stones are treated these days, but I would assume that it is very different and not as terrifying as how they were treated back in the medieval age. After learning about this, I'm convinced that this could double as a form of torture. Basically how it went down is a physician's assistant would be sitting on top of you while you had your legs strapped to your neck. And then as the assistant was holding you, the doctor would stick two of his fingies up in your little booty hole, press his fist against your pubes until he felt a hard pellet indicating a stone. After the diagnosis, then it would be removed through the bladder using a sharp instrument. Now I've never had a kidney stone, so I don't know how painful it is to have one, but for those who have experienced this, would you rather go through this medieval procedure or just tough it out until you pass the stone yourself? At number four, butt stuff. Even back in the medieval age, they had treatments for hemorrhoids. This illness was often associated with Saint Fiaker, also referred to as the quote, patron of hemorrhoids. A 7th century tale said that this monk cured his illness by sitting on a sacred rock for several hours, and so in the medieval age, some physicians believed that the same method could apply to other people's butts. Obviously, that didn't work, so some other superstitious physicians came up with an alternate and more nightmare-inducing way of getting rid of hemorrhoids. If you didn't want to sit on a sacred rock for an extended period of time, you could always get a red-hot iron tube put up your butt. Yeah, I don't think it gets any worse than that. At number three, Belladonna. Belladonna, deadly nightshade, whatever you want to call it, doesn't make it any less poisonous. This plant is one of the most toxic plants around, but that doesn't mean that people haven't tried to use it in their personal use. Normally, we want to stay away from toxic things like chemicals and X's, but back in the days of old, people said full scent and used belladonna as eye drops. Yeah, that's right. Even though this is literally poisonous, they thought, hmm, let's put it in our eyeballs. The organs that we use to see, because that's a bright idea, right? Many people, mostly women, used eye drops made out of deadly nightshade because it changed the size of their pupils to make them look more starry-eyed, and that was seen as a beauty trend. In moderation, these eye drops wouldn't really cause too much damage, but prolonged use of the poison could see some serious health concerns like stiff muscles, short-term memory loss, confusion, disorientation, and in some cases, death, because it could literally paralyze your heart. And if you're thinking, man, I'm so glad we don't do that anymore, then think again, baby, because if you've ever been to the optometrist and you've had your pupils dilated, guess what they use? That's right, belladonna. It's not harmful to put just a couple drops in your eyes and not to do it again for a while, but if you get your hands on it and start using it too much and in high dosage, then you're in for some trouble. At number two, trepanation. Trepanation is the process of drilling or scraping a hole into the human skull. Yeah, I know, that doesn't really sound like fun in the slightest, but back in the olden days, people did it, and it was a relatively common body modification for some reason. This practice was done in all sorts of cultures throughout different periods of time. During the medieval ages into the Renaissance, trepanation was used to treat epilepsy and mental disorders. This practice also dates as far back as the Paleolithic period. In ancient Peru, trepanation was done using a ceremonial knife called a tumi. In ancient Greece, it was done using a drill. Polynesians used sharpened seashells and in Europe, the procedure was done using sharp flint or obsidian. Though we know that in the medieval times and the Renaissance, trepanation was considered a medical practice, in ancient times, the reason for this practice is still uncertain. It could have been to try and fix damage from a head trauma, but it's also believed that this practice was done to heal mental problems, release toxic spirits, or even as some kind of ritual. And finally, at number one, knife hand. Now this one is by far the craziest medieval surgery in my opinion. So you know Captain Hook, right? got a hook for a hand? Well, this guy I'm gonna tell you about has Captain Hook beat by a landslide. A 6th century medieval burial was found in Italy and it revealed a male warrior who had a knife for a hand. Yeah, this man had a knife instead of a hand. 
This warrior had his hand amputated. However, the reason for said amputation is unknown. In place of the lost hand, the prosthesis was a blade. Now, I don't know if this guy lost his hand in battle or something and they just gave him the best that they could and that was a knife as a placeholder or if he just willingly chopped off his hand so that he could have a knife hand. But either way, that is so badass and I would have loved to see this guy in battle. At number 10, bloodletting. Back in the medieval age, medicine just wasn't the greatest. I mean, they had a plague that wiped out 50% of the population in Europe, and even their quote-unquote doctors were overlapping jobs. Barbers were cutting hair, obviously, but they were also setting broken bones and bandaging wounds, and I'm not sure I would really trust that, but back then it was a case of you get what you get. So I guess people weren't complaining all that much about their barber Joey from down the street giving them a cast, you know? But other than the practice of patching wounds and whatnot, they were also practicing bloodletting back then, and it was a little much. Bloodletting was a practice of withdrawing blood in order to cure or prevent diseases or illnesses, so doctors would use things like leeches to suck blood out of their patients, but they also used scarification methods to scrape away the skin to drain the blood, and others used lancets to slice open veins, sometimes including the jugular vein. I'm so glad that we don't do this anymore because frankly, I would like my blood to stay inside of my body. Thank you. At number nine, the king's evil. Being a king or queen in the medieval ages might seem like a cool job, but I don't really think it was. With the rivalries that these people had, they were at risk of being assassinated in one way or another. They had to worry about their bloodlines and of course, that thing that everyone had to deal with, illness. Some kings, to help out their people, were tasked with healing an illness called the king's evil, and you're probably thinking, well, these kings aren't doctors, how did they cure illnesses? And to that I say, well, they touched it, of course. This whole thing started in the 11th century, when Edward the Confessor became known for touching a person that was suffering from scrofula, aka the king's evil, and curing them. People thought that this was a miracle, and so for hundreds of years after that, English and French monarchs were tasked with touching the sick to cure them of this illness, because monarchs were believed to be an incarnation of the divine. Before we carry on talking about some of the bizarre medical practices from the medieval age, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, tooth worms. If you're one of those people who really hate going to the dentist, just be glad that you didn't have to go to the dentist during the medieval ages because that was an absolute nightmare and a half. Not only because they had no proper medicine or anesthetics, but because you could also get the worst diagnosis you could ever get, a diagnosis of an infection of toothworms. They believed that people could be infected with toothworms that caused a tooth decay and pits and holes in the tooth were home to a worm that looked like a tiny eel. What's worse than the diagnosis, however, was the removal process. They didn't want to pull out the tooth that was supposedly infected with these tiny worms, so instead they used a more holistic approach. A method that they would use to get rid of the worm would be to take a candle that was made of sheep's fat and various seeds, and they would hold it as close to the tooth as possible so that the worm would run out from heat and fall into a little dish of water that was being held beneath the person's mouth. That sounds like a horrible trip to the dentist, that's for sure. At number seven, pee reading. Now this might not be considered a surgery, but this medieval age tradition was probably one of the strangest medical practices I have ever heard. In medieval England, people were known to get diagnosed based on their pee. Back then, they believed that the consistency, color, and taste of someone's pee could diagnose someone's ailments. They took this method of diagnosis so seriously that they published books for the wealthy so that they could do this practice at home, and these books included illustrations and color charts so that they knew how to judge their own pee. According to their text, if your pee was white, then it was the ideal color, and that meant that everything was working just fine. If it was wine colored like blue or black, then that meant that something was very wrong. And if it was green, then you were basically on your last leg and you should probably get your will in order. Now, I'm not sure how accurate these readings actually were since medicine was basically non-existent back then, but they tried their best with what they had, I guess. However, I'm pretty sure you don't need a book to tell you that if your pee is wine colored, that's a bad thing. At number six, eye surgery. Our eyes are very sensitive, which is why it's so important to keep them healthy. Oftentimes when something is wrong with our eyes, we naturally go and get them fixed. But back in the medieval age, if something was wrong with your eyes, you really had to think long and hard about whether or not you really wanted to get them fixed because the procedure to fix your eyes sounded like an absolute nightmare. Back then when someone had cataracts, a surgical procedure called needling was performed and it involved having a doctor push a thick black needle into the patient's cornea. Remember, 
There was no anesthesia back then, so you were just raw dogging this entire experience. After the procedure was completed, the patient would usually be left with an unfocused eye, described to be similar to a camera without a lens. That didn't necessarily matter to everyone, because while it would be hard to read the Bible, it would still be okay to plow a field, and as long as they could work, that's really all that mattered. Number 5. Bed Chambers Do I need to say more? Actually, yes. See, while the bedchamber was the place where the deed was done, those lucky servants that were allowed to actually stay in this room with their lords and ladies often slept on the floor wrapped in blankets and soaking up the heat of the fireplace. The castle itself usually had a cold dampness about it, which sounds lovely. So there were often tapestries hanging on the walls to counteract this. The servants on the floor thing makes me think of when you had like sleepovers and you had to tiptoe through all your friends sleeping on the ground to leave the room. <laughs> Number four, gatehouses. Now for a place with the least amount of holes. Actually, it, it probably had the most. The gatehouse was probably the most fortified structure in the castle. The holes we have here were for the sole purpose of hurling or shooting projectiles. Some were for traps and obstacles. The gatehouse was a house for the main weak spot of the castle, the front gate. And as such, it had to be the most defendable part of said castle. It was also usually the most lavish and ornate part of the castle. If you're inviting Lord Reginald from across the way to your castle, you want him walking through that front door thinking, hey, this guy could absolutely defend against me, but also he has impeccable taste. Number three, the dungeon. You knew this was gonna be here. Don't pretend to be surprised. Well, guess what? It ain't as common as you might think. And it wasn't always a deep, dank cellar in the bottom of the castle. It actually started off as a prison in the tippy top of the tallest, safest tower. Apparently, keeping people in cells wasn't actually commonplace at first. You probably just, you know. But hey, when they did have dungeons, then yeah, they were pretty grim. They were always put in the coldest, darkest, most moist part of the castle. And they were usually just prisons. Number two, oubliette. Bouncing off the dungeon is a much smaller dungeon, and hey, another hole. Yep, this one is kind of worse than a latrine, though. You see, this is a hole that they would actually put people in. Imagine being put in a hole in the ground, where it was too small for you to actually sit down, with a trap door on top, too high to reach. That's an oubliette. The word oubliette is actually from the French word to forget, which is what they do. They'd put you in this hole and then forget about you to die. Lovely, right? Number one, torture rooms. Here we are. Now how many of you weirdos came here for this one? This room is separate from the dungeons usually, not always, but it was at least not very far. Still gotta keep your prisoners cold and dark as you make them squeal for the end, right? Wow, that was dark. This was the room where you'd keep all your favorite tools of the pain trade. Stretched, hung by your ankles, fire, tools of all kind. There were trap doors in some torture rooms too that would lead to dungeons or pools of water. Some torture rooms, like those during the Inquisition, had even thicker walls to keep the screams in. <sighs> Some of these torture rooms weren't used as often as they think though, as merely having a torture room was enough to get prisoners to give you what you wanted. All right, can we like move on now, please? Okay. Number 10, universities. Okay, owing a lot of school debt myself, I know a little thing or two about the educational institution. But when did they start and where and why? Universities have been around for like the last 13,000 years, apparently, with the newest uncovered Gobekli Tepe being flirted with possibly being the first university or educational hotspot in the world. But uni uni with like school colors and teams and stuff, that's straight middle high ages right there. University of Oxford was created in 1096. That's the classic riddle, isn't it? Which is older, the Aztecs or Oxford? Ever heard that one before? Yeah, these things are like old, old. A university for law and medicine was created in the year of 1088, the University of Bologna in Italy. Yeah, it became a thing when an organized group of students under the Latin motto of quote, nourishing mother of the studies was created. Pretty academic if you ask me. University of Cambridge, 1209. Like this is like almost a thousand years ago, y'all. At least some of the middle ages had some good traditions, along with like how to sever heads for court and stuff like that. 
I wonder if someone still owes school debt from like 1208, you know? Five shillings a month kind of deal. Number nine, Hastings. Medieval times wouldn't really be the medieval times without a couple of hundreds of swords clinking and clanking against a couple of other hundreds of swords clinking and clanking. Well, thousands actually. Hand to hand combat was a crucial part of business back in the day. New treaty signed, new land discovered, usually started and ended with a battle. The Battle of Hastings, one of the most important battles of the Middle Ages. Norman French army of William, the Duke of Normandy, and the English army under the Anglo Saxon king Harold Godswinson. The childless King Edward the Confessor in 1066 set up a succession struggle between families and the throne. Harold was crowned king after Edward's death, but faced invasion by William and the Norwegian King Harold III of Norway. The battle lasted from dusk till dawn, and William was crowned as king on Christmas Day 1066. Continued rebellions and resistance to Williams continued, but Hastings marked the start of this ancient British rule and cemented their place amongst Europe as the leading power in both army, academia, and religion. Basically, a really key time where everyone was fighting, Game of Thrones style for Europe. Like all of Europe. Lots of swords and heads type stuff. Number eight, taxes. Hey, tax season's coming up. Make sure you have everything nice and neatly organized. I know I don't. But why do we have to do them, you know? Where does this you owe me this come from? The Domesday Book or the Doomsday Book was a book created under William I, also known as William the Conqueror. The same name victor in the battle we just talked about. So medieval to name yourself the victor, isn't it? It is I, Kyle, the winner. Yeah, this guy basically drew up a book to document people's money so that he could tax them. Oh yeah, this was the first time surveyors kind of went town to town and recorded how much money you would owe for just doing you. Men would just show up at your house asking how much you made and document your spending habits. Five shillings on groceries, huh, Mildred? Right, and just another five for the phone plan. <sighs> Tax season's coming up. Talk about a bunch of crooks, huh? Owing someone money for just living on their land, trying to make an honest living? How dare they? Thank God that didn't catch on. Speaking of, I got a phone H&R Block. Number seven, The Crusades. We hear about it a lot, but we need more movies and Netflix shows about this time because it's really rich in history here. A three-part miniseries spanning over like 300 years. These bloody and ruthless wars were battled between Muslim and Christians for proprietorship over sacred lands and lands in the Middle East. Wars that resulted in like six million deaths. The Knights Templar, of course, a brotherhood of highly trained soldiers, horseback, bashing their way through the East. These guys were the real deal, the Navy SEALs of their time. Richard the First, leading the third and final crusade, earning him the name Richard the Lionheart. Yeah, back then the names were always something so aggressive and scary, you know? It wasn't ever like Richard the Billy Goat or Henry the Butterfly. Nah, we need fear. 300 years of religion, invasions, torture, political chess. It was the Wild West before the Wild West. Well, I guess the Wild East. The Wild Wild East, yeah. Number six, court. Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. Peter would have an absolute field day with this next one. But again, it's like a thousand years ago and people were not really sure what they were doing back then. Some things were innovative and great, and then there was like trying a rat before a court of law for eating food. Yeah. It's 1386 in the Norman city of Falaise, and ruthless and a rowdy crowd gathered to witness the execution of the city's most infamous convicted murderer. Spectators dressed in their best, and the prisoner was even given a last suit and a last meal for the occasion. I hereby sentence Mr. Wigglesworth to beheading. <gasps> Gasps everywhere. Yeah, a pig. Yeah, they tried a pig and sentenced it to a beheading. Like, also, isn't that just called breakfast? For more than like 300 years, all throughout Europe, strange lawsuits tried pigs, dogs, foxes, birds, even grasshoppers and slugs for crimes. Basically anything against people, property, and God himself. It started with creatures who had maimed or killed humans of importance, then animals that stole and ate crops, then like the snail made me do it type stuff. Yeah, prosecution after prosecution. This stuff's weird, right? Your honor, a small recess, please. Okay, basically what we're gonna tell them is that Number five, Shroud of Turin. They say art is subjective, but what does the Shroud of Turin really show us here? Is it JC? Is it Jesus Christ himself? Many believe the cloth shows an image of Jesus when he was crucified, and once you see it, it's hard to argue otherwise, hard to get out of your mind. Radiocarbon tests do date the cloth back to around 1260, and recent studies suggest that Shroud was used in medieval church plays that would depict this exact scene, the resurrection of one Jesus Christ. What do you think? Accurate representation or another case of 
face pareidolia. Face pareidolia is when you see Jesus and things. I look at our producer Chris. I see Jesus every day right there. A little bit more Jack than Jesus, but you know, same image, more or less. Number four, summer is canceled. Back in 2013, scientists discovered a volcano on Lombok Island in Indonesia that went off sometime around May to October 1257. And scientists all agree that this eruption was the largest blast that the Earth had seen in 7,000 years. So it was quite a spectacle, a horrible spectacle. If that cut to the next year, 1258, the following cold temperatures ruined crops and brought famine to pretty much all of Europe. Cattle were all dying off quickly. It was far too cold for them to even stand a chance. And it's estimated that London saw 15,000 deaths that year alone. Experts believe that this volcanic eruption was a factor in the Little Ice Age that changed global temperatures from the 14th to 19th century. That's like if Yellowstone went off tomorrow. It would be a really bad time, and then well, afterwards would be almost worse, if anything. No resorts for a while, I think. Definitely not. Number three, the Great Famine. The medieval adjective game. Back again with the Great Famine. Awesome, another great. All of Northern Europe suffered the Great Famine in 1315. So only like 60 years after that volcano went off. I mean like, what luck is that? What a terrible time to be alive. 1315 to 1317, two years of famine. Countless lives were lost. And of course, with people losing hope, crime rate shot up to an extreme level. Can't even describe some of the things that were recorded, but my God, people were horribly insane. The Great Famine brought unrest in peasants, but it also disturbed members of nobility. It's always nice when that happens, right? It's not all of us suffering. Some of these noble purple lords up here are also starving. Cool, we're even. They were set back and in turn, they gave up the oath of chivalry. Yeah, talk about the dark ages. They're like, eh, you know what? No. Number two, plague bear. Bus boys, but for bodies. Let's do it. My God, this one's really dark. The hot summer of July 1665, right before London saw that great fire. What to do with all these poor souls who have been hit by the plague? Now bodies at this point were literally starting to pile up. So we need a new profession, somebody that deals specifically with these horribly infected bodies. Any volunteers, show of hands? Yep, we got one. Like a plague bear, for example. There we go, just what we need. A plague bear has your back and your front and all of your infected places. Church wardens would organize burials. This was a normal thing back in the 1600s, but when the plague hit, they had to change things up. If somebody had the plague, well, these plague bears, they, these brave souls, they would step up. They were the ones responsible for transporting all these bodies far, far, away, and then they would bury them, right? Just way over there. Great idea, honestly, the further the better. Couldn't agree more. A church would house these plagued souls away from society. Now, it sounds sad, but this was the best call, all things considered. So no, you weren't visiting any of your deceased loved ones anytime soon. And finally, number one, medieval punishment cleaner. This one really sucks. Best for last, here we go. Back in medieval times, many executions were public. The town would come out, watch a hanging or two, and then grab some bread and then head home. They're like, hey, classic Sunday. This was normal back in medieval days. Medieval punishments were like an event, but like modern events, somebody has to stick around and clean the place up. One of the earliest documented executioners goes back to 1202. He was the OG headsman. His name was Nicholas Johan, and their nickname was The Justice. The Justice. Are you kidding me? My palms are already sweating. Are you sure it wasn't the mountain? My God. Afterwards, this position spread through many capitals and large towns of Western Europe, and with them came the execution cleaners. Yeah, just a squeegee and a spray bottle. They're like, hey, which table boss? Let's do this. Over his 36 years of ruling, King Henry VIII executed roughly 57,000 people. Yeah, welcome to the Middle Ages. Hope you like mopping. You're gonna be doing it a lot, like a lot, a lot. Kicking off our list at number 10, the London Tornado. We've all heard about the Great Fire of London in 1666. So let's talk about another horrible event from history, shall we? That's why I'm here after all. On October 16th, 1091, harsh winds from the Southwest took out more than 600 houses and a handful of churches. There was a mighty tornado. The Church of St. Mary was a rather unholy place to be on that specific day. The tornado killed two men in this building and it tore up the roof and timbers went everywhere. The rafters were actually ripped from the structure, then slammed down far away back into the earth. Turns out historically about half of these rafters were buried in the dirt. That's how much force was thrashing them about. Tornadoes are so scary. I feel a strong wind outside and 
I'm immediately back inside. That's it. I'm shaking in my boots. I don't mess with wind. Number nine, the great drowning of men. Such a tragic name. My lord. How about we take out the word great and all these references, maybe? I don't know. It's kind of horrible. In the Middle Ages, coastal areas around the North Sea were hot spots for flooding. Now, historically, there were numerous reports of flooding here, and for some reason, between the 11th and 15th centuries, this area would get absolutely destroyed. It would get completely swamped. And it's even larger than you can possibly imagine. The St. Marcellus flood took place on January 16th, 1362. Now, the death toll here, I mean, obviously, it's impossible to tell for sure, but historians believe it was at least 25,000 people. That's horrible. Atlantic gales were to blame for the rush of water because this event also goes hand in hand with the great wind of 1362. The great wind, awesome. The mighty wind, like it's not great at all. It's not really good. Number eight, one name. This next one here blows my mind. I never really thought about this before, but what was it like before we had surnames? Surnames were introduced to us in England in 1066, but before then, well, you were just Greg, period. That's it. There was another Greg, well, that was it. Now you guys had to fight till the death. No, I'm just kidding. At first, surname names were a little bit different. They were descriptions almost about the person you were meeting. So you'd meet a guy and he would say, hey, I'm Greg Red. Red signified his red hair. Makes sense. Greg Red, Greg Gray, he's getting a little old. Got it, Gregs, we're good. But the best part, your name could actually change over time because your description and then your appearance would also change. So one day you would meet Greg Red, but eventually his hair would fall out, he would age, then get stressed because, you know, he's living in the medieval times and all. And then once that happens, your name would change to match your new description. Now you're Greg Ball. Ball back then meant bald in Middle English, so everyone had the last name Ball. Isn't that amazing? Next video, I'll be Taylor Ball. I'll just be bald. Why not? Just change it up like Heisenberg. Number seven, medieval meals. Ah, uh, yes. I hope you're eating while you're watching this. If so, give it a thumbs up, take a big bite, and good luck. Seeing as the holidays just passed, I figured there's no better time to mention a medieval holiday tradition. I'm glad we don't do this one anymore. This one's pretty gross. Swans today, they're beautiful. We see them traveling in pairs, and we don't hunt them down because, well, that would be insane, right? Medieval days, swans were hot property. They were a delicacy of the upper classes. Christmas swan pie. Nice. Here you go. For you and yours. Enjoy. Merry Christmas. I would be crying on Christmas Day if I saw this on the table. They would actually stuff swans with beef, which I personally don't recommend. Turkeys, I'm like, okay, that we've dealt with. Swans, I'm like, no. But they're in love. They mate for life. Do we eat both? Let's eat both, I guess. Other medieval meals included peacocks, cranes, turtle doves, sparrows, and herons. Herons? Imagine Christmas dinner is a heron lying on the table. You're like, Really, Dad? I don't really want to eat this. This is a long, the long neck. Number six, the dancing plague. Okay, summer 1518, a summer we will never forget, sadly. One of the most bizarre events in medieval history, the dancing plague. The town of Strasbourg was calm, cool, and or collect until out of nowhere, one woman began to dance dance uncontrollably in the streets. She was convulsing, it was wild, but then soon others joined in and eventually there were over 400 people dancing their days away. Now, it sounds funny in some degree, but it's really tragic. This was not a good time at all. A great amount lost their lives due to pure exhaustion and heart attacks, and the authorities tried their best to help the situation, so they paid for musicians to perform for them while they danced, while they were convulsing. They're like, oh yes, bring in a jazz band. Let's complete this image. This happened a few times in Europe, not just once. Between the 14th and the 17th centuries, we still don't know what exactly happened, but there were dance plagues. It was a common occurrence. All we know is that it was some sort of illness. It was not like step up. It wasn't a fun thing like step up at all. No one's just popping and locking in the streets. They're like, hey, nice. Let's bring in some music. This is great. No, people were very sick. They were very ill. Number five, the Great Charter. Ah, yes, time for some peace. Well, kind of. A peace treaty, the initial document containing specific grievances under King John's rule. The year is 1215. Since these animals can't follow the rules, maybe we need to jot up some rules to follow ourselves. A document setting out the laws and limitations for the common man to King John himself. A legal system written down so that there are clear do's and don'ts to follow, like no free man shall be seized, imprisoned, dispossessed, outlawed, exiled, or ruined in any way, nor in any way proceeded against except by the lawful judgment of his peers. And the 
law of the land. Write all that down. Please write it down. Laws were important, and sometimes people needed to face the music. After John's death, the government of his son, Henry III, revised the document in 1216, dumbing it down in a little less strict and churchy book of rules type way. Less hearsay and more evidence kind of laws. Of course, still in folio, so V's were U's and L's were also the number one, so a little confusing sometimes, to say the least. Number four, Templars. The poor fellow soldiers of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon. I feel like you have to say that with a deep voice or it sounds weird. The Knights Templar, aka the Order of Solomon's Temple, or simply the Templars. Basically a Catholic military order group of one of the most wealthiest military groups in all of history. No pressure. Founded in 1119, based out of the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, a couple hundred years of this Navy SEALs type organization. Endorsed and encouraged under the Roman Catholic Church of Pope Innocent II. What a name. The Templars, an extremely trained super soldier outfit with the distinctive white mantles with the red cross. They were like the most skilled fighting units out of the entire Crusades Wars. What people don't know is about 90% of the organization was behind closed doors, ranging a network of financial techniques, manipulations, and treaties for the next thousands of years. Yeah, everybody focuses on the fighting part, but the chess game being played economically at the same time behind closed doors was much more terrifying. Basically the world's first corporation with a security team. Number three, knights. Keeping with the themes of the medieval times, other outfits of highly trained religious secret organizations, knights, brotherhood, fighting, all that uh, good stuff. Another knightly order. The Order of Brothers of the German House of St. Mary in Jerusalem. Also commonly known as the Teutonic Order. Thousand years ago again. Kind of like the Templars being a Catholic religious institution founded as a military society. We're talking 1190 in Jerusalem. It was formed to aid Christians and protect them in the Holy Lands where they would establish hospitals and churches. The Order, more of a small voluntary outfit made up of mercenary military memberships. Basically old dogs who could still fight were looking to do some private its security work. The Teutonic Knights were rich too, which led them to hire older and more experienced mercenaries from all parts of Europe. Dude, this is where all these secret societies started, huh? Couple initiations, couple tattoos, couple secret scars. A religious mercenary group who would just truck through Europe, swinging swords in the name of God. What a time. Number two, Jesters. In the 12th century, the title of Fool began, aka the Jester was born. A paid career of mockery, smut, laughter and tricks. A true triple threat. Most of the time, after years of service, these jesters were rewarded with land as payment for their loyal service. A famous fool named Roland Le Pateur was given 30 acres of land by King Henry II when he retired after his foolery, under one condition, that every Christmas day, Roland would return to the royal court to leap, whistle, and fart. Yeah. Just a whole year to write a seven minute banger of a set. No pressure. But it wasn't just farts and jokes for these guys apparently. Jesters also had a huge role in battles. At war, their job was to wage psychological warfare, boosting the morale of their side the night before with laughter, parties, and stories. And in the morning, when the two armies met, the jesters would ride or run between them, calming the nerves of their own side and men by making them laugh, singing silly songs, of course, and insulting the opposition. Yeah, just chirping the other team. This was a ballsy tradition. And most of the time, unfortunately, they were captured and sent catapulted back with a message from the other side. Imagine just taunting 5,000 bloody drooling men hopped up on IPAs and no sleep, just mocking them, like, to their face. No thanks. Number one, sports. Yeah, back then it wasn't a friendly game of handshakes and sportsmanship and stuff. More like no rules kind of sports. Like no rule soccer, AKA mob soccer. Yeah, I'm not talking about the mafia mob. I'm talking about a mob as an unruly amount of people running amongst each other in havoc. Yeah, town versus town. An unlimited amount of players. There was only two rules of this game. Get the inflated pig's bladder over the opposing team's line on the other side of town and no murdering. Yeah, no murdering. Okay, so this is rugby. This sounds a lot like medieval rugby, doesn't it? This game was played competitively and eventually outlawed even at Oxford University in 1555. Secret fraternities and training areas were all agreed on by each organization. The game got so competitive, bloody and out of hand, it was eventually banned at tons of different times in England. Quote, there is great noise in the city caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise, which God forbids. We command and forbid on behalf of the king on pain of imprisonment such a game to be used in the city in the future. Damn. 
Like band band, huh? Thankfully, the game of football has calmed down over the years. <laughs> yeah, right. Just go to a Manchester versus Liverpool game. At number 10, painting veins. Back in the 17th century in Europe, many people believed that extreme paleness was just the hottest thing. If you looked whiter than a ghost, then you were like the Megan Fox of the town. Many women were obsessed with finding new ways of making themselves look pastier than a white wall, and some of their methods were actually surprisingly creative. The cosmetic skills of women back then were actually pretty impressive. I must say. Wealthy aristocratic women were the ones who took part in this pale trend the most. They wore dresses with plunging necklines to show off the girls, and they painted themselves white using a powder. Frankly, this powder made them look pretty artificial, like you could tell that they weren't actually naturally that white, so to solve this, they came up with a new beauty trend. Drawing veins. Women would draw veins on their mommy milkers using a blue color to mimic the look of translucent skin. It's crazy to think how far we've come from this, because back then people were trying to look as pale as possible, and now we have people tanning themselves so much that it causes controversy. At number 9, Tiny Tea. During the Renaissance, fashion and beauty standards were changed drastically from what was popular in the years before. So much in society changed over this period of time, like what was seen as beautiful or desirable. Things like certain body types and other physical attributes had their own trends, but one of the weirdest physical beauty trends from back then had to do with teeth. Back then, the ideal woman had wide hips, a small waist, long legs, and small teeth. Yeah. Teeth had an ideal size. To people back then, the smaller the teeth, the more desirable you were. Why? I don't know. Because people are weird, I guess. Some people would even go as far as to file their teeth down to make them smaller so that people would see them as more attractive. Now, I can imagine that this would be a very painful process. Like, if you've ever chipped a tooth, then you know that uncomfortable, almost cold sensation of a broken tooth. So imagine that, but on all of your teeth. Yeah, you can count me out. Before we carry on talking about some of these strange things people did to be the belle of the ball, and yeah, there were some really, really weird things, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Nails for Days. These days, people get their nails done all the time. I love seeing crazy nail art videos online because they're often so creative. Some of the most fascinating ones are the crazy long nails. I don't think I could ever rock those, but I still admire those who can. The beauty trend of having long nails, though, isn't a new thing. It's been a symbol of beauty and status for many, many years, like years ago in China. Back then, having super long nails was seen as a way to show off your wealth and status. The average nail length amongst Chinese aristocrats was up to 25 centimeters or nearly 10 inches. This was all their natural nails too. And in order to protect their insanely long nails from breaking, they wore nail guards made out of gold. Not only did that protect their nails, but it was also another way of showing off their wealth because not everyone can live their lives wearing gold cages on their fingers. As you could imagine, having nails that long made it so you could barely do anything with your hands, and so that's why these aristocrats had servants, so they could perform the tasks that someone with super long nails couldn't. But would you ever want to have nails that long? <laughs> At number seven, long neck style. In many cultures around the world and for many years, having a long neck was considered beautiful, and so many women practice neck stretching in order to attain this level of beauty. This practice of neck stretching has been most commonly done by wearing metal rings around the neck, adding more and more rings over time. This practice was first seen sometime around the 11th century in Southeast Asia. The theory behind the rings is that they're so thick that they push the head up, therefore stretching the neck, but in actuality, the length the lengthening of the neck is caused by the rings pushing down on the collarbones. The origin of this practice is pretty much unknown, but it is theorized that it began as a way to make women look more attractive in order to prevent getting captured as slaves. But on the other hand, some people believe that this was a way of protecting people from getting attacked by tigers. Two very different theories, but nonetheless valid. Though this practice began so long ago, it is still a traditional body modification in some parts of the world to this day. At number 6, Tiny Tootsies. For many years, having the tiniest feet was seen as a popular beauty trend in China. Foot binding was a big body modification practice in China that began in the 10th century AD. It is said that this whole trend started because a court dancer bound her feet and the emperor at the time, Emperor Li Yu, really liked what he saw and soon it was encouraged for other women to do the same. Soon this practice of foot binding became a huge trend and it became associated with being able to find a husband. The practice of foot binding began when a girl was 5 or 6 years old. They would have their feet put in hot water, have their nails cut short, and have their skin rubbed with oil before having 
having their four smallest toes broken, folded over, and tied down. Then their feet would be bent in the middle to break the arch, and the girl would have to walk around like that over time, crushing the heel and sole of the foot. After about two years, the foot would be considered ready, and depending on the size of the girl's foot by the end, this would judge how easily she'd be able to be matched with a good husband. This practice continued all the way until the 20th century, where it started to lose popularity. For number five, we're getting a little spicy with risque's men's clothing. Now, you may have already heard stories or seen memes about ridiculously long pointed shoes and groin flattering armor, but did you know that provocative men's clothing was all the rage for a period of time in the medieval era. It's recorded that in the late 14th century, men were quite keen to be seen in overtly short tunics and thin tights. By 1463, a modesty statute had to be passed as men had upgraded to wearing cod pieces publicly, which did cover their mostly exposed genitals, but only by making them look cartoonishly large and bulbous in the process. A similar escapade happened with the Krakow shoe. These long, pointy-ended shoes were sometimes so so long that they had to be tied back around the wearer's ankles or reinforced inside with a whalebone. The same statute in 1463 also addressed limiting these Krakow shoes for those reasons. Seems like there may be a little bit of a compensation theme here. Both provocative dressing and shoe length were limited to those of extreme wealth after the statute passed, but that didn't stop the development of some more outlandish beauty standards. For example, number four in our countdown is Plucked Bear. Nowadays, whether you're scrolling through an app or walking down the road, you're likely to see advertisements for eyelashes and hair accentuation services. And while that may be pretty trendy and normal to us, now, in the medieval ages, having hair on your face would have actually made you stand out in a crowd. Women would remove their eyebrows, eyelashes, even significantly reduce their hairline so as to achieve a smooth egg-like effect. This was because the forehead was considered the center point of the face for many years, and so it would make sense to remove anything on or around it so as to accentuate it, right? Maybe. Moving on. If you're tired of her plucking herself bald, and she's tired of you wearing shoes that enter a room before you do, then maybe it's time for a good old fashioned medieval divorce by combat. That's right, you heard me. Coming in at number three is divorce by combat. This finding was discovered in historic German manuscript that laid out rules as to how divorce by combat was to proceed. Their decision to use combat as a means of, to solution was not unusual for medieval Germany, as trial by combat was part of their law system. Trial by combat was legally sanctioned duel that ensured whomever was to win the fight was deemed Right. There are many ways that these duels could be fought and various weapons and locations in which to have them. The divorce by combat trial was placed when a man was put into a three foot deep hole with one hand tied behind his back. The woman, however, would have a normal ground and be able to move freely. This was believed to ensure a fair fight between the sexes. Now there is some evidence that the outcome of these trials could still end in death even if the death was not as a result of the combat. It's said that if the man lost to his wife, he would be taken from his hole and executed in the town square. If the woman lost, she would be then placed in the hole and then buried alive. So yeah, I'd say maybe try talking it out a little bit first before resorting to a public throwdown that can end in death. And while we're on the topic of trials, number two on the countdown is trials of the dead. Who would have such a vendetta with the dead that they would have them unburied to stand a trial? Well, new Pope Stephen, that's who. In 897, the months old body of Pope Famorpheus, the first Pope to ever be executed, was extracted from his grave to serve trial for his alleged usurping of papacy. The new Pope donned the corpse in elaborate robes and even assigned a deacon for defense. You may be wondering why the new Pope Stephen had done this to his predecessor. Since a holy person's body was considered to become a holy relic in death, it became a holy right to display their corpse in public tombs or churches so petitioners may still visit their former saint to leave tokens or deliver prayer. What better way to ensure that you have devoted attention of the community than a postpartum smear campaign where your opponent can't defend themselves because, well, they're dead. Stephen found the deceased Pope from Morpheus guilty so that he 
he could toss his body into the Tiber River, as nobody can venerate his relic if his body is lost at sea. That's a pretty intense way to usurp the person who had the job before you. Jokes on Stephen, however, as shortly after this trial, he was executed just like his predecessor, making him once again come in second to Femorpheus. Call it karma. With that dose of crazy, we can move on to Medieval Madness, which ranks at number one in our countdown. What was the Medieval Madness? Well, if you're a fan of rye bread, you may not want to listen in on this. In an era without refrigeration systems as well as poor hygiene, produce was left to natural elements. As a result, mold and bacteria growth was common and would of course migrate into food. Ergot mold is the most well known for its effect on the brain. It caused wild hallucinations and extreme emotional changes as the chemicals in your brain became imbalanced. The consumption of this mold and bacteria has had a variety of exclusively unpleasant side effects, such as vomiting, diarrhea, convulsions, delayed visions, even mania and psychosis. These symptoms make it obvious as to why this could be labeled as a madness. The extreme cases of ergot consumption would of course lead to things such as loss of limb, gangrene or death. And this connection between molding rye flour and ergot poisoning wouldn't be made until 1670. So for hundreds of years beforehand, commoners saw ergot poisoning to be things like demonic possession. Many theorize and connect the medieval madness to that of the time periods of the witch trials. The trials began in 1691, a year of intensive wet and cold which produces a higher level of ergot. They ended abruptly in 1693, a year said to be sparse on rye grain. If there's less to consume, there's less ability to be poisoned. Making it arguable that there could be a connection between the two, especially as a side effect of ergot poisoning could be mistaken as demonic possession as previously mentioned. And that is also seen as a symptom of witchcraft. Still, this may not be the kind of bread you want to chase. <laughs>